Um, so let's move on to what you're doing now. You, in terms of your full-time job, which is you're a machine learning scientist at Astrocade AI. Astrocade is an NVIDIA-backed startup that leverages generative AI. I, I can't believe startups are getting into that. <laughs> <laughs> an NVIDIA-backed startup that leverages Gen AI to allow anyone to create games with natural language prompts, regardless of technical skill. And I've got to say, prior to us having done any research on you and preparing for this episode, I imagined in my mind that what Astrocade was doing was assisting video game developers mm -hmm. in creating assets for their video games. And so it was interesting for me to learn that what, I, what in fact Astrocade sets out to do is to allow somebody to who has no technical skill whatsoever, whatsoever to, with a natural language prompt, create a full working video game, um, potentially not just for an individual, but for multiple players as well. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we are working on an app for your phone for just regular users, and uh, in particular, some like the idea of kids and younger people to make little games and publish them, really a platform for creation of games and sharing of games and uh, socializing and making friends within games. That's the goal. So I've been there for over a year now since I started before finishing my PhD, actually. And it does have a connection to Stanford. It started by a former lab mate, uh, Amir Sadergian, who uh, was in my lab, graduated a couple of years before, and then worked on another, in another startup as their lead of AI, where my advisor, Silvio Savarese, uh, was a major, I think, I believe, co-founder. And so in a way, it's a little bit weird because I, my PhD was focused on robotics, not generative AI, certainly not games or anything like that. But because I've done all these side projects, uh, which we've covered. I've written blog posts, I do podcasts, newsletters. I <laughs> even posted YouTube videos, uh, photography, a lot of stuff. The idea of enabling people to be creative with AI is something I really looked, uh, wanted at a startup. You also play video games, right? I do, yeah. yeah. Uh, haven't try to develop them as much, but that's partially because that requires coding and a lot of specialized skill. So yeah, at a near the end of my PhD, I wanted to join a startup rather than a big company to be able to have impact and like really care about what I'm doing rather than just optimizing some tiny feature of some product. And uh, the idea of having something that regular people use, not businesses, Although that's a very maybe ill-advised idea for a startup because typically, you know, doing B2B, doing something for businesses is mostly what succeeds. Uh, y Combinator, I believe, only wants things for businesses, not for consumers. Uh, but I like the mission. I like the people involved. So I joined and have been working there for a while. Yeah, I think with B2B, you get big contract sizes. You're not totally dependent on just like network effects. You can be, you know, you can potentially in the beginning just have a couple of big clients and that'd be enough to get you from a series A to a series B kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, you do have that B2B thing there. But B2C, if you can pull it off, it ends up being a really cool thing because it's something that, you know, any of your friends or family, people that you're lecturing to, your podcast listeners, they can all be signing up and checking out Astrocade. So that's right. That's something cool. It's interesting. I also didn't know until you, even through our research, I wasn't aware that it was a mobile app that you're developing. So that's interesting. Yeah, part of that is because we are still at the stage of not being super public. We are in, let's say, pre alpha, where we, it turns out this takes a lot of work. It turns out, compared to a lot of startups where you train an AI model and then you just give someone a website to write a prompt and get the output, games are hard. Uh, and generative AI isn't today sufficient to just output things. You need to really think about the user experience, the system that enables you to use AI to make the video game. And so, yeah, even though we've been working on it for a while, it's still kind of a bit closed off and we're hoping 
by the end of a year to have a wider launch, maybe alpha or beta for more people to to be aware of it. Nice. Yeah. I don't know if you're able, able to give us a sense of like how complex a game that you're like targeting being able to render, say like in that alpha state or beta state, because I imagine you're kind of expecting over the years to have more and more complex games be possible, both because the technology, the underlying LLM capabilities improve, as well as, you know, your development of the product, feedback from users. Um, so for example, I recently, at the time of us recording, I had just this week recorded an episode. Um, in fact, it's actually, it should be the most recent episode by the time your episode is published, episode number 798, which should be, should be the preceding episode before this one that we're recording right now. It's on Claude 3.5 Sonnet. And one of the cool things about that Claude 3.5 Sonnet release from Anthropic is that they coincided that with the release of a new user experience, Artifacts. Mm -hmm. And that is a big shift for me, allowing you to have, you have two panels side by side, where the left-hand panel is that cl now classic <laughs> generative AI experience that we've had for two years uh, through ChatGPT, where you're having the conversation on the left, back and forth dialogue with the machine, but on the instead of having the outputs like um, images and anthropic, Claude at this time doesn't directly output images, but you can end up outputting images anyway by asking for like it to generate SVG graphics or something because it can write the code to generate the SVG graphics. So you can get in this right hand panel, the artifacts panel, you can get images, you get your code outputs, you get um, w rendered websites that work. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I did in creating the preceding episode, episode number 798, is I recorded uh, sometimes those videos, sometimes my, my five minute Friday episodes have a video component where I'm demoing something. And so I was messing around myself with how this would work. And I kind of had a, my idea, an idea in my head of something that I thought might challenge it, which was to create a simple video game. And I said, create a, an interactive website of the shell game, which is, uh, it let me know in the dialogue part on the left that that's also sometimes called the ball and cup game, uh -huh. where you have, uh, you know, so this is, I guess, like a classic game. It probably stretches back a millennia of where you have three cups on a table surface. Someone puts a ball under one of the three cups, and then you kind of shuffle the cups around on the surface, and you ask the person to guess which cup it's under. And... It was able to render that game for me. It wasn't the very first rendering. So that, so it in a few seconds, in like five, 10 seconds max, it renders JavaScript code uh, for both this interactive front end that works in that artifacts panel on the right hand side within the platform. So you don't have to like, you know, set up web hosting yourself or anything. You all of a sudden have this very simple cup game, uh, uh, shell game that you can play in the browser. And the very first time, the animations weren't very compelling. So I said to it, you know, can you make the animations look more like shuffling? And it did. All of a sudden it looked like shuffling cups and I could track, but then the third time I said, well, I can't see the ball going in. It didn't render the ball. Uh, can you do that? And it did, it wrote code to be able to render a ball going into one of the three cups and then they shuffled around in a realistic looking way. And if you track it with your eyes and you click on the right cup, it'll say you got the right cup. And so it's is interactive video game experience. So that to me does feel very impressive. I was blown away to see those kinds of things happening. Um, and so, you know, I know that that is kind of possible, but I imagine that the kind of experience that you're creating in Astrocade is more nuanced <laughs> than the ball and cup game. Yeah, I don't know how detailed I can, I can get, but yeah, yeah. I can I get you a sense. And yeah, it's interesting you note that because uh, I believe very early on, like a year ago now, may, either OpenAI demonstrated this. I believe maybe they did. This was one of the things they said is, uh, here, take a look, we can develop breakout or something mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. just some prompts. And there are some companies working in that direction. Oh yeah, you know there was the um, there was a demo of like creating a spaceship mm -hmm. moving around and yep. shooting at asteroids or something like that. Yeah, and it was kind of it was interactive. You were, you, it was exactly it was one of the I think it was with GPT four maybe 
that that was one of the demos was showing somebody programming a video game that an interactive video game that became more and more complex you sort of like okay render a spaceship that looks like this and then have the, these controls allowed to move around like this and you so you can gradually describe iteratively um, a game where you're shooting at asteroids and you get points for destroying asteroids or whatever that's right yeah so the kind of north star what we want to achieve at the end of I don't know how many years, but uh, as AI gets better, is pretty much that, text to game, where with very little effort you can make anything. Uh, but turns out that's a little hard. It, uh, at present, you can make like Snake, you can make Breakout, but when you get to this idea of, let's say, even a Mario level, or even beyond the Mario level, you want something kind of pretty flexible. Yeah. And let's say you want multiplayer in it, well, that requires a lot of infrastructure right. and code beyond what you can get with a single kind of output or even iterative output. So uh, we are aiming in terms of complexity in this kind of direction of having an avatar, being able to play with your friends, uh, being able to play with everyone and uh, either be competitive or cooperative in uh, relatively small games where you do have your own character so you can create an avatar with your face and, and play them. Uh, so it's maybe not the intuitive approach you would immediately guess of just take an LLM and make it do all the work. There's a lot more that is required at present today, but maybe that's maybe that's a good thing <laughs> in the sense that uh, we're doing a hard thing, I think, and uh, hopefully we get there and people will really like and and have this uh, experience of doing what you can't do right now with just an LM.